and ask a question at that time. So with that, I will turn it over to Susan Couch. Enjoy the class. Thank you, Susan. From Susan to Susan and then on to Alan. Um, we are very fortunate today to have Alan Baca with us. I think many of you are probably familiar with her from Wood TV 8. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of history on Alan. Um, she's the lead meteorologist at Wood TV and she's been there for seven years. Uh, she received her bachelor's in meteorology from Valparaiso University. Prior to moving back to Michigan, she was the chief meteorologist at KTVH in Helena, Montana and a meteorologist and environmental reporter at WCTI in New Bern, North Carolina. She recently was awarded Best Weathercast by the Michigan Association of Broadcasters, as well as Emmys for Weather Anchor and Weather. She is originally from Kalamazoo, loves hiking and flying with her husband, who's a pilot, and loves local ice cream. We're gonna to have to tell her about Captain Sunday. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Ellen. Thank you so much for being with our group today. Yes, thank you so much for asking me. I love the weather. And one of my favorite parts about my job is teaching the weather. So when I um, first moved back to West Michigan, I was fortunate enough to teach at Valparaiso University. So anytime I get a teaching opportunity, I get really excited. And I think it's so cool that you guys get together and want to learn. So I'm looking forward to your questions. I have a whole presentation that's prepped. So I'm gonna go ahead and share screen because meteorology has so many beautiful visuals and it helps so much when you have visuals. So I have a PowerPoint presentation that I'll be showing and then using to help describe basically why weather happens. And then we'll break down even more specifically weather in West Michigan. So I'm going to share screen, make sure that it pops up for you guys. Everyone see that okay? Yep, looks great. Excellent, okay. So meteorology in West Michigan. Um, I have worked and lived in a lot of locations and I've done meteorology for even more. And I have to tell you, West Michigan is weird. We have so many weird weather patterns and of course, Lake Michigan, which makes things even more difficult. But something that's so neat about meteorology is it is this mixture of almost science and mystery. So we're still learning, for example, why tornadoes happen. Here's a beautiful, beautiful example of a tornado. And this is a massive one. And you'll notice that it looks like it's slow moving, but in reality, it's moving at about 60 miles per hour towards this gentleman who's recording it on his deck and getting hailstones. <laughs> Remember, when you have severe weather, you want to go into the basement, but a lot of times that's hard for people to do. So one of the reasons why we have meteorology, of course, is to answer questions like this. Why do tornadoes happen? Why do hurricanes happen? Why do we get hailstones? And what's so interesting about meteorology is it's an observational science. So the more observations we have, inherently the better the forecast gets. In fact, even though I'm a broadcast meteorologist, broadcast meteorology only accounts for about 10% of all meteorology fields. So 90% of meteorologists are studying things like tornadoes. We have private sector forecasting, instrumentation, modeling. We have satellite launches and study. And all of it is to, again, answer questions like this. Why does a tornado happen? Where is it going to go? And how much money will it cost? So even though this video is taken back in 1998, it's been studied quite a bit because it shows us the life cycle of a tornado. And up until recently, we haven't had really good footage or data on things like tornadoes. So even a video like this, where you can look up and you can see the swirl in the center of the sky through the life cycle of a tornado has helped us greatly. So we're going to get back to severe weather momentarily, but first let's just start at the big picture. Ellen, I want to point out one thing because we tested this before is that yeah. I can see your cursor, but it's oh. not your pointer. So if you do want your pointer, I want to give you that heads up. There you go. There wow. it is. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Just so you guys know, this is a multimedia presentation. I have a laser pointer tool. It's very exciting. 
So again, talking about meteorology and the fact that it has developed rapidly over time, just a brief history. The start of meteorology was back in 3000 BC. One of the earliest texts that we've been able to find is an Indian Hindu text called the Upanishads. Then from there, the water cycle was defined in 600 BCE. Aristotle's Meteorologica, which was one of the first discussions about why weather happens and the planet and the atmosphere, that happens in 340 BC, but the thermometer was not invented by Galileo until 1593. From there, the barometer was invented, then the hydrometer, which measures moisture in the air, and believe it or not, for a hydrometer, they used human hair at first. Blondes apparently make the best hydrometers, by the way. Global circulation theory happened in 1735. And then this is one of my favorite science experiments that happens in the 1850s. So in the 1850s, at this point in time, some of the early scientists knew the rough basics of weather, but they wanted to know more. So because we didn't have that good of instrumentation to look outside of where you're standing, uh, we only had in situ instrumentation, something that you could carry with you like a hydrometer or a barometer or a thermometer. These gentlemen decided to pilot a hot air balloon and they launched it all the way up in the sky. They went through 15,000 feet of clouds before their balloon ripped open at about 23,000 feet. And when they came crashing down, they had ice crystals covering their entire garb because it was so cold, about 38 degrees below zero aloft. But that study right there by some brave humans was the whole reason we know that the temperature gets colder with height. In more recent history, in 1920, air mass theory was developed. In 1957, military radars, which were used to test for incoming aircraft, were suddenly noticed to be able to track meteorological phenomenon. So from there, in the 1980s and the 1990s, we used that military radar data to create 88D radars, which could sense rain and thunderstorms. Since then, we've had some massive computer upgrades, supercomputer upgrades, and then a dual pole radar developed. So much so that I used to get, well, and I still get, the joke that how can you be a meteorologist when you're only right 50% of the time? Back in the 1920s, you were lucky if you were right 50% of the time. But now we have an accuracy rating, even without a, a human helping, of about 83%. So just because meteorology is an observational science, inherently as technology gets better, and as we launch new studies and devices like satellites and upgraded radars, we are going to get more accurate. So much so that eventually I might not have a job. <laughs> you might not even need me anymore. It'll be so accurate. So we have basically showed you the development of meteorology through time. But the biggest question, the whole reason why anyone has ever done this is to answer the question, why does weather exist? Why does it happen? And even though we have all of these studies and the plethora of instrumentation through history, the big reason weather exists is because the earth is trying to even itself out. This is the earth from space. And as you see it spinning, we can tell that it's curved. And we know that the sun is hitting the earth more directly at the equator than it is at the poles. So even though the Earth seems so contained and so uniform, it's constantly being met by an inequality of energy. We are getting a closed system where the heat is greater at the equator than it is the poles. So the Earth, like any humid, would not like this. If you are hot in your middle and cold at your feet and your head, that wouldn't feel too good. You would want that to be evened out. And the weather is basically the Earth's attempt to even that out. So when I went to school, you learn all the equations of motions. You talk about rising motion and sinking motion and why the Earth does the what, the what and the why that it does. 
And so this is basically the equations for motions. So you've got temperature, you've got spin, friction, and sunshine. And that gives you either rising motion or sinking motion. Because not only is the Earth trying to even out from equator to poles, it's also trying to even out from surface, the top of the atmosphere. So the whole reason why weather exists at all is because the Earth is trying to make imbalances balanced. So as it spins in space, it's trying to move warm air to colder locations, cold air to warmer locations, and move around moisture. But because it starts with that inequality, that imbalance of sunshine, it's really difficult for it to happen. So that's why we get all of the craziness of weather and all of the different effects of both time scales and local scales, because everything has to work together to try to even out these imbalances. So as we move forward, we'll just kind of explain why weather happens, but we'll just simplify it down instead of that big equation. Here are some fundamentals of meteorology, which I'm sure are going to be shocking to you. One, warm air rises. Two, cold air sinks, right? And this is a big one. Three, air will always travel from high pressure to low pressure. Always, always. High pressure to low pressure. Again, the weather is very much like a human. I don't like to be under high pressure. I would much rather sit on a beach drinking a pina colada in a low pressure environment, right? The air is the same way. It will always go from high pressure to low pressure. So if we look at a simple thunderstorm, this process is happening. A thunderstorm is a tiny area of low pressure. So air is constantly rushing in towards the center of low pressure. As the air rushes in at the surface, it creates these towering clouds, which grow higher and higher, right? So you have air rushing together at the surface from high pressure into the low pressure. It spirals up into the sky, allowing that hot air at the surface to get higher and higher. And as our hot air balloonist in 19 or 1850 told us, colder and colder to even out that imbalance. And then it brings that cold air back to the surface with a rainy downdraft. So this is a hot day. Area of low pressure sucks up the hot air, makes it cold, drops it back to the surface, therefore equaling out that localized imbalance. So we can see this process of balancing inequalities, warm air rising, cold air sinking, and air moving from high pressure to low pressure at all sorts of scales including the planetary scale. So let's just start with what we know again, right? Curved Earth, sun rays hit the Earth at angles. So the equator is hottest because it gets the most direct sunshine. But where we live at about 45 degrees latitude, we get an angle. We do not get a direct sun angle all the time, especially at the tilt of the Earth. We get more direct rays in summertime. At 30 degrees, we get a 30 degree angle of incoming solar radiation. So just inherently, because of the curvature of the Earth, we are hottest at the equator. So a really cool scientist way back in the day said, okay, well, that makes sense. I think I figured out the way that the Earth works. Of course, the hot air will rise at the equator and then it can't go out into space. We have the atmosphere trapping it in. So it must go out in both directions from the center of heating. And he was kind of right, that does happen. But instead of it going as a full conveyor belt to the, coal, the poles and then sinking, what we see instead is it only going to about 30 degrees north. So we have tropical conditions, hot weather right at the equator. But by the time the air aloft has traveled to about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, it starts to sink because it gets colder. So the cool, dry air will descend and it's rained all of its moisture out by that point. So that's why at about 30 degrees north and south, we have most of our planetary deserts. That's also why the tropics tend to be so warm and so moist because as the warm air rises, we immediately see the cooling and the rain. 
So our scientist, Mr. Hadley, who created the Hadley cell said, oh yeah, one big conveyor belt. And he wasn't quite right, but he was onto something. Instead, we see about three of these per hemisphere. So we have our Hadley cell, our ferro cell, and our polar cell. We live here in the ferro cell. What's so cool about this is we have the rising motion at the equator, the sinking motion at 30, and that helps to create our winds at the surface and aloft. That helps to create our wind belts. So you live in West Michigan. What direction do most of your storms come from? West. That's why. We have our cells aloft creating wind belts at the surface. There's also some uh, technicalities with a, a conservation of angular momentum, which also gives us some westerlies here. But that's one of the reasons, actually that's the reason, along with the fact that the earth is spinning, that we get our weather from the west. But if you've ever been to the Bahamas, what direction does your weather come from? The east. Because at the surface, you get the east release. All because of these wind belts that are formed because the sun heats the earth in, e in equal ways. So here's a really great example of it. You can see our hurricane season here. This is 2017. And our hurricanes are being carried by the easterlies up into 30 degrees latitude. And then our weather comes at us from the west. So something else that's kind of interesting, early sailors in Europe used to get out on the ocean and their boats would push them down to the equator southeast just like these hurricanes are initially doing before they wrap back up. So that's one of the reasons why we were able to figure out our wind belts. What's interesting is where we have the descending motion at 30 degrees latitude, we mostly have areas of high pressure, dry areas with no wind. And this is called the doldrums or the horse latitudes. So if you were a sailor and you got into one of these quiet areas of the ocean, you could be stuck for weeks without moving, weeks without any wind. And so they got the term horse latitudes because it was so quiet with so little wind that they would ditch their horses overboard so that they would be light enough to move, which is a sad story. <laughs> but that's why 30 degrees is called the horse latitudes. But today we're just going to be talking about the polar jet stream and the subtropical jet stream more than anything. So the polar jet stream is where we live. And sometimes in the summer, the subtropical jet stream will climb farther to the north. But one little trick, if we talk about the jet stream, is knowing that the polar jet stream separates cold air from warm air. And sometimes the temperature division is like as high as 60 degrees between the cold air and the warm air. So here in West Michigan, at the surface, if you've ever had a warm, sunny day, it's like 90. And then the next day, it's like struggling to get into the 60s. That's because we had a massive drop in the jet stream. We've gone from the warm side to the cold side. Individual storm systems will travel along the jet stream too. So as they travel along the jet stream and make their way into West Michigan, we get increased precipitation and a change in temperature. So again, this is planetary stuff, but we'll start to bring it in in an even more localized level. But you might ask, okay, so I get it. We're trying to get warm air to go to the poles. We're trying to get cold air to spin down towards the equator. But why do storms spin? And this is an easy one. Storms spin because of the Coriolis effect. So if you were to stand in Texas and you were to throw a paper airplane towards Nebraska, it would not land in Nebraska. And that's because the earth is spinning from west to east. So as your paper airplane is flying, the earth is turning and instead your paper airplane would land in Washington DC. Same thing happens with storms. There's a diversion to the right. So as the earth is trying to balance inequalities in heat and pressure and the earth is also spinning, it creates this really cool balance of forces which result in spinning storms. We have an area of low pressure here. We have high pressure outside of it. All of the air is trying to move towards that center of pressure. 
But because the earth is spinning and it diverts everything to the right, we have a counterclockwise spin with low pressure systems in the Northern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, it is opposite. So this is a cool little diagram that I think helps out quite a bit. We have high pressure and we have low pressure. Air, again, would rather be drinking a pina colada. It would like a low pressure environment. So as it's moving from high to low pressure, the Coriolis force in the Northern Hemisphere pulls it to the right, creating that turn, that spin. So that's why we get swirls. As warm air is trying to travel north, cold air is trying to travel south, it can't take the direct path between high and low pressure, between warm air rising and cold air sinking. So instead it has to take this curved swirled approach. So there's a really beautiful little quote that I like, uh, and this is pretty famous to meteorology and it's big whirls have little whirls that feed on their velocity. Little whirls have lesser whirls and so on to viscosity. And that's exactly what we're going to see. As we move down in scale to the synoptic scale, we see big whirls transitioning down to the little whirls and following the exact same rules. So here we have our jet stream and we have ridges and valleys. In the ridges, warm air is allowed to pool up to the north. This is where we usually see an area of high pressure. In our valleys in the jet stream, we have cold air that's trying to sink down from the south because again, the jet stream divides cold air from warm air. In each one of these valleys, an area of low pressure at the surface will form, helping to drag up rain from the south. So that's what it looks like at the surface. We have high pressure here and we have a spinning area of low pressure here, trying to take warm air and push it to the north. So here we have a ridge of high pressure giving us sunny weather and a trough of low pressure giving us stormy weather. So that's basically all you need to know. And that's why on the news occasionally, we will just have areas of high pressure with sunshines and areas of low pressure with storminess. So one of the best ways to describe this, and I usually do this with my kids, is to pretend, hi. Is to pretend that you're a happy little cumulus cloud. So areas of high pressure and areas of low pressure are best described by thinking of the pressure on top of a cloud. So if you are a little cumulus cloud floating in the sky and you're suddenly in an area of low pressure, you're going to have less pressure exerted on top of you and you're going to grow. So a lot of times I'll have kids, I'll pick like the strongest kid in class, and I'll say, okay, are you really strong? And he'll say, yeah, or she'll say, yeah, I'm really strong. And they say, okay, hold out your hands. And I'll have them pretend to be a happy little cumulus cloud. We will stack books on their hands representing air pressure. In a normal pressure environment, there's not a lot of weight. But in a low pressure environment, huh, they're able to grow big and strong into a low pressure storm cloud because there's less pressure holding them down. But let's say you're under a high pressure environment. That high pressure environment means there's a lot more weight pushing down on you. So with that being said, that's when I usually stack a ton of books on top of the kids' hands and they get all shaky because it's very hard to grow or to lift anything up when you have a lot of pressure exerted on you. So if you're out and about and you see clouds like this, flat clouds, that means that you're in a high pressure environment. If you're out and about and you see clouds like this, it means you're in a low pressure environment. Less pressure means the clouds are able to grow. So if you have a giant area of high pressure, you're going to have sinking motion and sunny skies. If you're in a giant area of low pressure, all of the air is going to rush in together and grow up because there's less holding it back. So in a nutshell, high pressure gives us sunshine and low pressure gives us storminess. What's so cool too is because we have rising motion over low pressure, there becomes a void at the surface that needs to be filled by rushing air. So as air is rising, it leaves a void here. So all of the air at the surface rushes in and it spins in a counterclockwise area. That's why you get counterclockwise areas of low pressure pulling air from all directions. And that's why high pressure areas have clear skies as things descend. So this is how it looks on a weather map 
you have air flowing in a clockwise manner outward and then flowing inward in an area of low pressure. So if we look at a storm system on the map, on the news, you would notice that you have warm air to the south because areas in the Northern hemisphere have warmer air closer to the equator. So let's say Louisiana, and you have colder airs to the north. And this area of low pressure is trying to wrap everything together and in inward. So as it does so, it creates this collision of cold air and warm air because everything is rushing to the center of this area of low pressure. So because of that, you get a warm front, which is the leading edge of warm air where storms happen, and a cold front, which is the leading edge of cold air where storms happen. On a weather map here, this is the cold front, and this is the warm front. So you can see the collision of air is what causes all of the storms with this area of low pressure. And we have weather maps that show us that we transition from high to low to high to low. So for example, today, we have an area of low pressure with storminess that's going to move towards us and an area of high pressure will take over. So that's why we have storms in the forecast for tonight, basically. So it's, again, all of these scales working together to just even things out. But storms take energy. They take that sunshine initially to launch the clouds into the sky. And sunshine is the primary fuel for thunderstorms. So here is an example of a particularly strong supercell. This is a thunderstorm that has tons of energy with it, and it's just like an area of low pressure aloft. It's wrapping everything together. That's why tornadoes have suction power, because they're sucking everything inward, just like a big area of low pressure. So we have warm air that's being wrapped in from the south, cold rain-cooled air that's being wrapped down from the north, and right there is where we see the tornado signature. And that's where you have the maximum area of convergence and velocity. So tornadoes are basically just very, very tiny areas of low pressure. So we know at a grand scheme, low pressure wraps things towards itself and that's why we get thunderstorms. In a single thunderstorm, everything rushes into that point where there is a tornado. So the biggest reason as to why there is a tornado is that there's a massive sudden imbalance in pressure and temperature. And the atmosphere's only answer to solve that is to create an exceptionally violent tornado to even things out from the surface to aloft. Without that tornado, that localized atmosphere would stay imbalanced and the earth couldn't handle it. So the whole reason why we see tornadoes is because of a sudden rapid imbalance, which creates the surface air and the air aloft to create a quick transition. And that creates the vortex. So supercells happen all summer long. And this is what a normal supercell looks like. But in Michigan, we rarely see typical supercells because Michigan is very difficult and tricky. So instead of the classic hook echo, a lot of times, we see something that's much messier. But at its core in meteorology, a tiny thunderstorm is exactly like a big area of low pressure. So big whirls creating little whirls down to the surface. In fact, if we were to slice a thunderstorm and look at what's happening, you can see the exact location of a tornado is where you have that rapid convergence. You've got cold air on the north side and the heavy rain. We've got the warm air rolling in and creating a flanking line. So again, just this video again, I showed it to you earlier. You can kind of see how the atmosphere is just trying to balance itself out. Warm air launching aloft, a massive change in pressure creating tornadoes at the surface, and cold air being created aloft rushing down to the ground. So how about West Michigan? This is what you probably want to know a little bit more about now that you know the basics. So West Michigan is more difficult because we have Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan creates a lot of its own little microclimates. So how many of you guys have been to the beach in the summertime and you get there at like 10 a.m. and it's hot 
and it's humid and it's a quiet day and it's perfect out. And then about halfway through the day, you suddenly notice that the wind is picking up. And then the temperature starts dropping off at the beach. You have this strong onshore wind. The reason why this happens is because Lake Michigan creates its own tiny areas of low pressure and high pressure. So if you head out to the beach at like three o'clock in the afternoon, this happens out in Florida too. If you've lived in Florida, you know about like three o'clock, there's like a daily thunderstorm. Basically what happens is the surface starts heating up, hot air rises, creates that area of low pressure. We know low pressure drags air into it at the surface. So it starts dragging cold air on shore and that creates a lake breeze. Lake breezes are the reason why our coastal areas are colder in the springtime. And lake breezes are also why occasionally you can notice a cloud bank hugging the shore. Sometimes lake breezes are the trigger for our severe weather because we don't live in Oklahoma. We don't live in Texas where you have those classic supercells that are untouched. We have muddled environments. So a lake breeze is actually what caused the tornado outbreak uh, here in Michigan in 2016, where we saw six tornadoes here locally. It was a normal day, low risk from the Storm Prediction Center. They didn't have any alerts out, but a lake breeze started and as it rolled towards shore, it triggered our tornadoes. Lake Michigan, of course, is also responsible for our belts in snow. So if you've wondered who sees the most snow, well, we've got Ottawa County down through Allegan, basically. And it's interesting, you can see the curvature of the shore here for Michigan. This actually creates its own convergence. So you have air that's rolling on shore, and sometimes this air towards Van Buren County gets kicked northward, and sometimes the air to the north in Muskegon, it, kicked southward. So you get this extra fire hose event right through Ottawa County. So on a typical year, we have our snow belt, but there are a lot of little bullseyes in Allegan County and in Ottawa County. In fact, Milwaukee only sees about 48 inches of snow per year. So Lake Michigan, in some cases, almost doubles the amount of snowfall, depending on location. Severe weather in West Michigan. I'm sure some of you guys have been uh, around or remember the Kalamazoo tornado of 1980. I'm sure some of you might even remember the Standale tornado or have heard stories of it. The truth is in Michigan, we've had a lot of really small tornadoes lately and we've had more wind events than anything. So out of wind, hail and tornado events, we by far see wind. We typically see them around this time of year. So May, June, July. That's when most of them occur here for West Michigan. January, February, March, we almost see uh, zero, which makes sense, it's still cold season. But a lot of our most intense tornadoes happen late April, early May. So if we were to ever get an EF5 again, or even a Kalamazoo tornado, which was an F3 that passed through the downtown, more likely than not, it would occur in April and May. And the reason being, the jet stream is much more active then. It gets much more of the peaks and valleys, bigger collision of warm air and cold air. So the stronger the collision of cold air and warm air, the bigger the imbalance, and the more likely that the atmosphere has to do something violent in order to even it out. In terms of what time of day we usually see severe weather, it's often in the evenings. So I showed you those thunderstorm uh, videos just briefly, and it all starts on a sunny day, right? A sunny day where the sun is heating the ground. And the sun has to heat the ground in order for the ground to heat the atmosphere. So oftentimes if you're storm chasing, you go out to a spot that you think severe weather is going to occur later in that day, and you wait. And you watch as those flat high pressure clouds feed on the sunshine through the day. And they will try and try and get kicked back down and try until eventually they accumulate so much solar energy, so much sunshine from the day that they break the cap and they erupt upward. That usually takes all day. So because of that, most severe weather occurs late in the afternoon to evening. 
Here's a check of all West Michigan tornadoes. And you can see we generally have a lot of weaker ones, a lot of EF zeros, EF ones, EF twos. But occasionally in Michigan, we have some of the big ones, F fours, like the Flint tornado and F fives, like the one that cut through Saugatuck and then Standale. Something that's interesting about the F five tornado is that it touched down right after rolling on shore. So there is a big fallacy, there's a myth that tornadoes can't cross over Lake Michigan or that the lake will save you from tornadoes. And we can see from this map right here that that's not true. So many tornadoes have touched down right along the shore and the strongest one in West Michigan's history did as well. Basically the atmosphere was so built up and so strong that once it hit land, that tornado touched down. It didn't matter that it was traveling in April over a cold Lake Michigan environment. So if you ever hear someone say that a tornado can't pass over a lake or head into a valley or track through a city, Michigan is a prime example that all those things are not true. Here's a tornado that passed over a lake. We have the Kalamazoo tornado, which passed right through the downtown of the city and is also, by the way, in a valley. Believe it or not, tornadoes have also touched down on top of mountaintops as high as 13,000 feet. So tornadoes can basically go wherever they want to go. One of the difficulties in West Michigan though, is we have so many small tornadoes and small tornadoes are harder to detect. So especially recently, you might be watching the news and being like, we have so much technology now. Why wasn't there a tornado warning? Well, the reason why is, again, we don't see a lot of really classic tornado warnings here. Classic tornado warnings have a specific structure. They look like tiny areas of low pressure. They've got the hook at the bottom. They're usually standalone and not muddled in a lake breeze. But here in West Michigan, we have areas of storminess that they're embedded in. And oftentimes they occur on cloudy days instead of just sunny ones like we look for with storm chasing where you need to build up the heat all day. So we basically have these tiny embedded thunderstorms that are in high cape low shear environments, which means uh, <laughs> high shear low cape is what that should say. They're not, there's not a lot of instability, but there's a lot of changes in wind. So here's your radar tower and it's cutting through a thunderstorm. It's cutting through the middle to top portion. Michigan tornadoes lately have been occurring in about five minutes or sometimes less, sometimes on the ground for just three minutes. And they're occurring in the lowest level of the atmosphere. So if you have a radar beam, which takes two to even five minutes to swing around, ingest the data and report it back to the meteorologist. You can have a radar that's swinging over its beam in a different direction as a tornado is forming and on the ground, and it could actually miss the tornado completely as it performs a full scan. And that's even for storms that are close to the radar. The farther a storm is from the radar, the less likely the radar will be able to see it if it's a really quick Michigan tornado. The beam, as it goes farther from the earth, cuts through a more northerly portion of the storm or a higher portion of the storm. So it misses that low level circulation. So you could have a tornado touch down, take down someone's barn and then lift back up and the radar would not even detect it or the signature would be so weak and only pop up for one scan that no meteorologist would issue a warning for it. We have incredibly subtle, quick, and small tornadoes here in West Michigan, and we have for the last 10 years or so. So the next time there is a tornado that touches down and there's no warning, just know it's because our observation, our instrumentation still needs to get better. We're part of this timeline that's massively upgrading and updating and part of a history that tracks back to 13 or 3000 BCE but we still have a ways to go.
because the radar is one of the only tools that we have to look inside the storm to see what's happening before it touches down. And we're still even trying to figure out why some storms that exhibit a lot of spin produce a tornado and other storms that exhibit the same amount of spin don't. And the closest thing that we can come to is the fact that some of these storms have an extra energy imbalance that needs to be rectified and others don't. So just to remind you what an F3 does, this again is like the one that passed through Kalamazoo. Roofs and walls are battered, small houses are destroyed, and almost all of the trees are uprooted. We have not seen an F3 tornado in our area since about Kalamazoo. So that's 40 years. F4s in West Michigan are plotted as such with an F4 or an EF4, enhanced Fujita scale, which takes into account how well a structure is made. This will, an EF4, will take down well-made houses. Sometimes structures will actually be lifted and cars can be picked up and blown around. A lot of times big trees can be airborne in an F4 tornado. You can see the F4 here is part of the one that tracked through the Standale region as well. And then this is the biggest memorable one. We have not had an F5 tornado in West Michigan since Standale, which was back in the 50s, which means most people alive today in West Michigan have never experienced a West Michigan tornado that was stronger than an F3, let alone an F5. So we'll hear stories about people being picked up in their car and thrown around. We'll hear stories about downtown, downtown Standale being completely devastated and demolished. But we don't know what that's like. We have never seen something like that. In an F5, we see incredible damage. You have to get into your basement for an F5 tornado to survive, usually. Well-made houses are completely swept clean and carried away. Entire towns are eliminated, like the Joplin tornado back in Missouri in 2011, and cars and trees are carried away. What's interesting about this storm path here is this is considered West Michigan's tornado alley. If we were to ever start to see more classic tornadoes again, they would more likely form here, Holland through Grand Rapids. And what's problematic about that is we've seen massive developments as our population has expanded. It's no longer just farmlands, right? We've got ballparks, we've got downtowns, we have highways that are packed. Grand Rapids is rapidly expanding. So you have to think about not just the strength of a tornado, but the path that it's about to go through. That's one of the reasons why the Kalamazoo tornado is so memorable was because it went through a downtown area, because it took down buildings and impacted so many people. If that same tornado would have gone through farmlands, it would not be remembered. In fact, there's one that clipped Calhoun County just a few years later, an F3, and no one even remembers it because it didn't hit anything of importance. So when it comes to tornadoes, we have to think about how strong it is and of course what it's hitting. Also, when you do a storm damage survey, you have to take into account how well some of those structures are made. We've all had shoddy contractors or heard about a friend that has. You have to look to see how well made a structure is to assess the strength. But regardless, an F5 tornado will take down anything in its path. So here's a look at Michigan tornado climatology. Again, with Michigan tornadoes, We've seen a decent amount, and actually the last several years, we've seen far, far fewer. We used to see 16 a year in the Lower Peninsula, and now we're down to like 10 a year. So the amount of tornadoes in Michigan lately has been dropping. Significant tornadoes for West Michigan, we saw one in the 50s, one in the 60s, one in the 70s, F4s and F5s. The 80s, we had Kalamazoo, but since the 80s, we have not even seen a significant F4 and F5 tornado, which means we're a little unprepared, I think. And that's why sometimes you'll see us do specials about these past tornadoes, because if you look at climatology and you even look at climate change or changes in patterns, 
there's no indication that climate change would change how many tornadoes we'd see. Michigan has seen a lack or a drought of strong, intense tornadoes. But Wisconsin, Canada, Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois have all seen significant, if not violent, tornadoes in the last decade. All at altitudes or latitudes, I should say, that are higher than us or surrounding us. So it just means that Michigan has been missed if you look at some of the studies. This particular stat has not been affected by a change in climate. So again, we don't know when the next big one will be, but there is a high certainty that we will indeed see another big one. Something else that's very interesting, just harkening back a little bit to history again about tornadoes in Michigan and West Michigan, the Palm Sunday outbreak, which happened in the 50s and impacted Michigan and Indiana, is the whole reason why we have watches and warnings today nationally. There was no watch or warning system in place before then. So watches mean conditions are favorable. Warning means there is a storm that could at any time drop a tornado. After the 50s, when the Palm Sunday outbreak killed hundreds, nationally, the Weather Bureau said, we have to do something to at least alert people when there's a volatile day coming up. This picture is from the Palm Sunday outbreak. And this picture is incredibly rare, but it shows the exact moment when the tornado cycled. So this is an F5 tornado in Indiana in the Palm Sunday outbreak. And within 30 seconds, this F5 tornado lifted and it reproduced another F5 tornado onto the ground. Again, in the 50s, our communication tools were very low. Our forecasting tools were almost non-existent and our warning network was not even there. We didn't have tornado sirens in place either. So because of the 50s, we have watch and warning and we also started to get tornado siren networks. What's interesting about tornado sirens is they're really imbalanced. So Kalamazoo has tons, but Muskegon, the county of Muskegon, has zero tornado sirens. And one of the reasons why Kalamazoo has so many is because they had the Kalamazoo tornado back in 1980. After something drastic like that happened, they wanted a way to communicate in the future to have people take cover, even though we haven't seen an intense tornado like that since. So that leads us towards the second half of our presentation, and it will just be communication and preparedness, and then also, uh, also a look at climate, since we touched on that a bit. And then we'll leave some room for questions. I know I've talked a lot, <laughs> and questions are usually the best part. So communication and preparedness, uh, this is really interesting. We've been talking about how our technology has advanced over time, but is it actually an accurate forecast if people aren't understanding what you're trying to say? If I'm on the news and I say there's a 50% chance of showers and storms, and you don't really know what that means, and it rains in the morning, but it doesn't in the afternoon, are you upset because you thought that would be a 100% chance of showers and storms because it rained 100% that morning? Or do you think it's 50-50 because it only rained half of the day? Or do you think it's a 50% chance of showers because it only hit 50% of our viewing area? Our communication has a long way to go. So as our technology has been upgrading, there's also been a rapid push to increase our communicate, communication skills. I can't even say communicative, <laughs> which is funny because I was trying to reiterate about communication. So studies like this have been done lately, and this is trying to get people to assign words to probabilities because probabilities are kind of difficult for us to wrap our brain around. So if an assigned probability is 100%, people usually assign that to words like almost certainly or highly likely. But it's interesting to see what some of the words or phrases relate to. Better than even is probably one of the more effective phrases that we can use on the news if we had 60% chance of showers and storms because there's a high correlation between what that means and what that actually is. You can see some of these like we doubt, 
a lot of people have a lot of confusion as to what that means. So again, there's a really increased effort to break away from 20% chance or 30% chance because the way that we determine that is coverage times area. And instead, there's a big effort to use phrases. So the whole reason why we want to do this again is for preparedness, because everyone takes action at a different point in time. Everyone will have a different threshold of when they need to get inside to their basement, right? A hospital staff, if they knew that they had a 20% chance of being hit by a tornado, would start to move people into the halls at 20% chance. But my dad, who's drinking a beer on the porch, probably wouldn't go inside until he had a 90% chance of being hit by a tornado. So part of meteorology is to try to take those social impacts and the ways that people think and integrate that into our warning system so that warnings get better and better and ultimately more people pay attention when they need to. So I think that this is a really great example. This is the tornado video that I was showing you guys earlier. And this guy is watching a tornado oh, this don't look good. for what, seven minutes here? Still raging off of the side of his porch. And it's getting closer and closer to him and he's videoing it. Sorry, there's a little profanity, but we learned here how unprepared he actually is. Susan, get my pants. He says, Susan, get my pants. <laughs> This guy has been watching a tornado move towards him on his porch for seven whole minutes, potentially longer, and he doesn't even have pants. <laughs> so again, meteorologists are trying to reduce that false alarm rate, and they're trying to create an increased approach or a better way of determining how to produce tornado warnings. So this is the future of tornado warnings. Instead of creating a polygon to surround a storm, Scientists are going to use rapid data to plot little plumes out ahead of the tornado. These plumes are called probability plumes. And when you see the pink, it means you have a 100% chance of experiencing a tornado. In orange or yellow, you only have a 50% chance or a 20% chance. And the reason this is important is because, again, a school full of elementary students might start to take cover if they have a 30% chance of seeing a tornado. But someone like that guy sitting on his porch, not wearing pants, he might need a 100% chance of experiencing a tornado to actually take action and take cover. You'll also notice these plumes are not plotted out too far in advance. And that's because studies, social studies, have showed us that people will be the most responsive to a tornado warning when they're given about 18 to 23 minutes of lead time. If you give someone lead time, say, hey, there's a tornado coming and you let them know a whole hour in advance, the preparedness action is actually less because they think, oh, I've got a full hour. I'm gonna bring neighbor so-and-so some soup and pick up the kids from school. They think they have time. So they don't take action immediately and they end up having worse problems. So there's a sweet spot when it comes to how long you have to warn out. And also there's a sweet spot in terms of when people will take action because it's different depending on who you are. So that's just a look into what might be coming down the pike for us in meteorology in about five years or so. They've been working on this for the previous uh, 10 years. So I actually got to go to a, a study in Oklahoma to test out this uh, program to see if it would be effective for broadcast meteorologists, but it's so interesting. Another thing that you guys will probably be noticing at home is that we have a new approach to how we're conveying winter weather advisories and warnings. There's going to be a lean away from seeing how much snow will fall and instead just impact dependent. So this is more the spot, the stoplight approach. You'll probably see green means low impact, yellow means some impact, and red means high impact. Because colors are a much easier way of explaining to people what they're about to see with an incoming winter storm. This is a good map to show that example. This is new. This, is, uh, this just came out, I think, last year or the year before. 
but you'll notice it's for our lakeshore areas and we have yellow meaning minor impacts and then we have orange which means moderate impacts. Snow forecasting is very difficult because it has to come in a range and because there's such a variation over area, especially in the Lake Michigan belts. So instead of saying, oh, you're gonna get six to eight inches here and have two of those inches melt on impact and so-and-so only has five inches in their yard and they're upset because they heard eight, instead, we're going to start leaning towards an impact base. You probably won't have trouble in the yellow getting out of your driveway, but in the orange, you might have to budget an hour or two to shovel. So this stoplight approach is a way of veering away from the way things were and a move towards more effective communication. So lastly, we'll just talk about weather and climate and then hopefully I'll take your questions. Hopefully this has been interesting to you guys too. Um, I find it very interesting just knowing how much the weather can change and how much it changes with time. So a good way to explain the difference between weather and climate is this imagery. Let's say your puppy dog is weather. It changes from day to day. So we see this in West Michigan. I mean, one day it'll be 80 and then the next day it'll be 60. And then the next day after that, it'll be sunny and then it'll be sunny for three weeks. So the weather is more like the dog moving back and forth from day to day, but climate is the trend. It's like the person walking the dog. The dog has to stay on its leash. It has limitations, but it's able to fluctuate on its limitations. Climate is the direction those limitations are going. If we look at climate over time and we look at the US, we can see that we've had an increase in extreme maximum temperatures. Over time, since 1910 to 2019, we've had more record-breaking highs than we did in the past. If we look at warmest lows, you'll notice again from 1910 to 2019, it's a similar trend where we get warmer with time. We have more record-breaking low temperatures with time. If we look at precipitation, it's a very similar trend where we're getting wetter with time, more extreme rainfall events with time. And we just saw that here in West Michigan. We just came off of the record wettest one, three and five year period ever. And they were all stacked together. Then after that, we switched to drought and immediately had two solid weeks of rain, second wettest June on record. So it's not that we've never seen extremes before, it's the fact that the extremes are happening more and more frequently. So we have to look at the trend, where that guy walking the dog is going. In terms of landfalling tropical systems, you'll notice that the trend isn't as noticeable, and that's because you have the whole land mass thing that you have to take into account as well. Just because you have an really strong Cat 5 hurricane doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make landfall. But more of those Cat 5 hurricanes means there's probably more likely a chance over time that we will see one landfall. So this trend is less noticeable, but also still of concern. So for those of you that are wondering what are some other global imp implications or changes, we've noticed that over time, we've seen a change of our belts of wet and dry. Our drier areas, our sinking motion, are expanding and getting wider, moving up into the Carolinas and expanding farther north into Texas. Another change that we've seen has been in the Sahara de Desert. So in 1902, it was smaller. And in 2013, it's grown substantially. This is interesting as well. We've gotten drier and drier out west over time. So right now we have tons of forest fires. We've been seeing record-breaking heat out west, even in the news today. And over time, we've seen the shift towards drier air moving further and further to the east. What's interesting about that is it's changed our tornado alley. 
So growing up, you probably learned that Tornado Alley was Texas, Oklahoma, Nebraska. Today, Tornado Alley has shifted into Texas, from Texas into Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Georgia. We're seeing more tornadoes. Our Tornado Alley has shifted into Georgia, Tennessee, and Kentucky over time. In terms of frost zones, we've also seen a change there. Our zones have started to flip so that the frost layer is further to the north. And I've talked to a lot of local farmers actually, especially apple farmers, cherry farmers, and they've noticed that their frost and freeze season on average has changed. And what's unfortunate about that is the consistent steady frost and freeze, the permafrost and freeze has shifted and because we're starting to see that push to the north, it makes our crops more susceptible to those sudden freezes or sudden frosts. So they've actually been losing a lot of crop because instead of the season just staying consistently cold through springtime, we have these warmer, shorter seasons where you get like a peak or a valley of frost or freeze temperatures and that leaves your crops more susceptible or more open to damage. Here's permafrost, and we've also seen a northern uh, retraction of that. So that has also changed. I really like these. I think they're very nice and visual and they do a good job. So that is basically meteorology from a planetary scale uh, down to the surface and hopefully down to West Michigan with a bit of communication and a bit of, um, oh, I don't know, climate thrown in. But I wanted to leave enough time for your questions because I'm sure living in West Michigan, you have a lot of meteorology questions that I did not answer. Uh, why storms do what they do, uh, questions about past events, what have you. So I have some tools ready just in case, but um, yeah, with that being said, I have some time for questions if you guys would like. So everyone there, uh, Ellen, there are not any questions currently in the chat. So I okay. would encourage everyone or anyone who has a question or a comment to unmute themselves and just go ahead. I have about five of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I was nine going on 10 back in 56. Yes. When we had the tornado here in Holland. Yes. Okay. Um, I know one thing I noticed about this, the atmosphere when we were outside, you, you know, it? before the tornado, there was a, a pungent or a, a smell that was not normal. Mm. Uh, and I'm just wondering, chemically, is was there something going on that causes that change in a, a sensible thing, like a, the smell of something? That's an excellent question. So my best um, guess to that would be that because that was such an intense storm and because you had so much air rushing towards that center of low pressure, it was probably pulling in smells from farther away from you than you would normally smell. So what you were probably seeing is the inflow, but you were smelling it. When we would storm chase out in the plains, you could look at the intense storms that were forming and they would be sucking up dust. That's how strong the inflow is. So I'm not sure if chemically there's any relation to anything happening in the clouds and creating a smell, but my best guess would be you had something that was like 10, 15 miles down the road that you on a normal day couldn't smell, but because it was such an intense storm, you could. Okay, that's one of the five questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, direction that they usually come from, is, is there a, a basic direction they come from? Because I thought that they'd tell us, you should stay in this side part of your, your basement mm -hmm. because they're coming, they come from this direction. And I, you know, I'm only nine years old, so I don't know what it was. Right, you're just trying to do what people are telling you to do. That's an excellent question. Tornadoes in the mid latitudes where we live, usually track from the Southwest to the Northeast. And it's because of those planetary scales we were talking about. They're traveling with a parent storm that's moving that way. So back in the day, they used to say, okay, the tornado is coming in from the Southwest. You wanna go to the Northeast side of your basement to stay safe. What they didn't think about is in a tornado, there's so much chaos and wind when that rolls over you and so much surface change with 
how that uh, spiral would be moving over you, those suction vortices, it does not matter what part of the basement you're in. Basically, get in the basement and know that everything's going to be flying around because there's so much happening. There's so much turbulence and churning. But back in the day, they used to say, yeah, get into one side of your basement. Yeah, we could see the tornado from the basement window. Oh, my gosh, it's terrifying. My mother had seen it from our pantry window. She said, kids, get downstairs. <laughs> and we all, all of us went downstairs. It was, no, but I could, you know. I had noticed yeah. that smell in the air before we went mm -hmm. down, you know, and everything, because we were, it was one of those days was hot and, you know. Yeah, but this, was the it, air, was it, it really real cold quiet. The day after? Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, how, how does a tornado dissipate? That's a great question. So again, um, it's basically when the atmosphere just decides that the imbalance has been equalized. So we still don't know. Um, that's one of the things that storm chasers and scientists and researchers are trying to figure out, like, why will one form in a particular spot and why does it lift? And the only theory we have is that that intense area of low pressure that formed to equalize the imbalance was fixed. And so it says, so it, oh, you don't need me anymore. Uh, and it just, it dissipates. It just shuts Okay, down. so it does lift. Yes. Yep. All right. One more thing. I yeah. can remember being told when we were little, look for clouds that look like the buns on, a, on dinner roll buns yeah. as a formation. Is, okay. that, is there anything to that? Um, so those are probably mammatus clouds. They look like pouches falling mm -hmm. down from the sky. And uh, oftentimes they form on the underside of a thunderstorm anvil. So you can have them on a day where the thunderstorm isn't even that strong. Um, they just form when there's a lot of moisture in that layer. But yes, a lot of times with thunderstorms, you can see those uh, bun clouds. Um, okay. I love that. I've never heard of them described like that, but I'm positive that's what well, they thanks. are. Thanks. Yeah. Those are, that's, that's my history. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks that for asking. Thanks, Suzanne. I have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Jane is asking, what causes straight line winds? Oh, excellent question. So straight line winds are basically when you have, uh, usually what happens is there's so much cold air, so much uh, rain cooled air from that storm as it was like sucking up moisture and heat all day that it has to come back down. It's gone aloft into the air, like our hot air balloons pilots. It's gotten cold and cold air sinks. So it has to rush to the ground. If there is no circulation in the wind, it just flaws like flat into the ground. And once it hits the ground, it can't go in the ground. It has to go out. So the cold air smacks the ground and it pushes out. And it pushes out with such intensity that it, it creates straight line winds. So you can have this happen in a pocket, like a single thunderstorm, or you can have a line of storms where all the cold pools line up together and it's almost like uh, linebackers rushing you on a field. It's like coming at you and all of it is straight line winds down. So that's how that forms. It's just too much cold air aloft that has to come down. Awesome. You're getting some activity in the chat. So oh, good. <laughs> I, yeah. I've never done a Zoom call like this before. I usually interact with people the entire time. So the whole start of the presentation, I was like, oh gosh. Well, we <laughs> have this. a good we have some time. We have about yes, exactly. Minutes. And this is a question as a meteorologist who's local. This is a great question. When hiring meteorologists for this area, do you find that meteorologists are interested in coming to Michigan to work? Mm. Or do people prefer working on weather where they grew up in a familiar place where they understand the people impacts of weather? And that's from uh, either Bridget or uh, Louie morale? <laughs> uh, that's an excellent question. I would say people have a tendency to go back home. Um, they remember what impacted them as a child, and they innately understand it a bit more, I think. Uh, for example, I experienced the derecho of like 1998, and I remember having the power out for two weeks at my house. And uh, I remember the snowstorms as a kid. And so I kind of have that embedded in my West Michigan knowledge. When you have people that come from different areas, they absolutely can learn. But uh, I think it's harder for them to understand lake effect. I think it's harder for them to understand lake breezes sometimes. 
you will learn it in class, but it just takes a lot longer because you don't have that subtle history embedded in your mind. Um, that's a great question. So we usually have a lot of locals. I think everybody here is local and most everybody at the other stations are local as well. Good, thank you. What is the difference, David's asking, between partly cloudy and partly sunny? It's a great question. So some people would say nothing, nothing. They're the same, it's about 50%. Uh, we typically say partly cloudy is a lean a little bit more towards cloudy and partly sunny is a lean a little bit more towards sunny. So partly sunny is like 60% sunshine and partly cloudy is like 60% cloud cover. So it's not just marketing a good day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm sure you never do that. Of never. Course. Scientifically never. based. No. <laughs> um, do you, I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Do you have hail forming? Does hail form in most tornadoes? Asks Tina. Okay, great question. Yes. So we usually have it on the northern side of a tornado. So uh, the tornado forms near the rain free base and out on the northern side, that's where you get the hailstones because you have so much air rushing into that storm that's a little area of low pressure and it gets cold that it usually creates hailstones. So all a hailstone is, is it's a tiny ice crystal that's traveled up and down inside the storm cloud so many times that every time it goes up, it gets another layer of ice and then it falls back down and then it goes back up and gets another layer of ice. So tornadoes are usually attached to violent storms. So almost all tornadoes will see hail associated with it. I should make one caveat, unless we're in Michigan, most of our, most of our tornadoes are just jerks. Uh, they're small, they do not uh, form in a classic way. And I think the last tornado event we just had here like a few weeks ago, we had six confirmed tornadoes across Michigan and like no hail reports to the entire thing. So classically, yes, is the answer. A couple more questions. So okay. David Kelch would like to know, can you explain the Bermuda Triangle? <gasps> the Bermuda Triangle, ooh, that's a good one. So uh, not magnetically, I don't know why the planes go down, but I do know that uh, because there's usually a, a Bermuda high, an area of high pressure right there, um, we typically don't see a lot of storms that pop up there always. Um, but occasionally you can get a hurricane that will slice across it, which takes everybody literally by storm because they don't usually travel through that region. They're usually steered around. Um, but no, I've never been asked that question. I'm going to have to write you back uh, privately, see if I can find some. But I, as far as I know, there are no meteorological reasons why uh, there have been so many problems in the Bermuda Triangle. That, that, that question was from Sue. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's a good one. I always love when I get a new one. And so we, that's so cool. But yeah, um, usually we actually have something called the Bermuda High. It's a Bermuda High pressure system. So it's like almost sunny all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but occasionally you can get a, a, a hurricane that does not follow the rules. So yeah. Um, we have a uh, question from Tom Aaronshorst. Um, when, when I was a boy, he says, I read that cirrus clouds are likely predictors of several days of good weather. Is there any similar crudely predictive value of any cloud formations? So there is some value in looking at clouds, um, but they are not slam dunks because there are so many variations that can take place. Cirrus clouds are said to be indicators of fair weather because they typically are kicked out a day or so ahead of a lower cloud base. So when you would see a cirrus cloud, you would know, okay, uh, there's not a lot of low level moisture. If this is attached to a warm front or a frontal system, it's probably a good day or so away. So I would say that's like one of those old wives tales that has a little bit of uh, weight to it. Um, you can also look at uh, halos that form with the cirrus clouds around the moon. That usually means you've got like a day or so of fair weather. Um, and then remember the easterlies that we talked about, the tropics, how the storms come at them from the east instead of the west. The stormy, what is it, red skies at warning, Sailors take warning, red skies at night, sailors delight. 
you have to remember that was made for people traveling around the equator. Um, so that would hold some stock because if you had a red sky to the east of you, um, that would mean that it was headed your way. Um, so red sky in the morning usually meant a storm was on its way, uh, but the clouds on the other side of you meant that you're in the clear. So sometimes those do have some stock. Other things are not true. Um, leaves flipping over a certain way before a storm. It happens a lot. And I, I feel like that's one that I personally cling to, but that's never been studied to be accurate. <laughs> I have a question. Okay. You mentioned, they mentioned the smell before. Yes. Could it be that because of the lightning in there, it was causing ozone production, which has an acrid smell? Absolutely. Uh, I'm not sure if that would have been able to travel to the surface as well, uh, unless it was an incredibly active lightning count day. I don't know if we have lightning data from that event, um, but a lot of times you need something to take what's ever happening aloft and push it down to the surface in order to experience it like that. But yeah, um, we do know that lightning helps with uh, the nitrification of soil because it's able to split and help create ozone. So that's a great theory. The other question, I, other thing I have is when I lived in Evansville, Indiana, uh, I had a row of pine trees across the back of my yard. And one night I heard this horrible sound, which was like a freight train. I looked out, this tornado was starting very small, like maybe, 10 feet across, it ran across my backyard, taking all the trees down about 10 feet high, all of a sudden jumped up, passing over a big high school and then hitting a, uh, a big building, a Lincoln National Life building and just expanded and destroyed the building. Yeah. And just paperwork all over the place. But it started in my backyard and yeah. it was a terrible, terrible sound, but it was so narrow. Mm. They usually start as these single suction vortices. And as you mentioned, um, tornadoes, tornadoes are, they're made of air, right? We wouldn't be able to see them if it wasn't wrapping down condensation or picking stuff up from the surface. So at inception, usually a tornado starts tiny and then it can intensify. That's what happened. Yes, like that picture that I showed you, the EF5 that forms like and that's why we treat tornado warnings so seriously is because it can look small on radar, but then like 30 seconds, it can be big enough to take down a building. Yeah, that's incredible. What an incredible memory to have, be able to say that you saw that happen. It was terrible because it yeah. was night, but there was lightning. So I could mm. see this thing and it just, when it, it took just a few seconds to go across the back of my yard, taking every tree down at about 10 feet off the ground. And yeah. then it jumped over some homes, mm -hmm. jumped over a huge high school. Yes. Goodness, and then it, went across the freeway and hit this, this three or four story office building, just wiping it out. Yeah, and we've noticed that they can do that too. Tornadoes do, you know, jump. They take, but they're not quite strong enough. And so it'll lift until it can get that circulation stronger. It happened. Yeah, yep. Thank you, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Good, good question. Thank you. Yeah. And Marie is uh, asking a question about you. Okay. You clearly have a passion for meteorology and a gift of communication and clear explanation. What influenced you to pursue this career? And can you describe a day in the life of being a meteorologist? Yeah. Um, so I think, I think one of the reasons why I got really into meteorology is I have an older brother and sister by about five and six years. And so they rented the movie Twister and I was only like eight years old and I was not allowed to see it. Um, my parents said, no, Ellen, it's, you know, it's, it's too scary for you. So I snuck downstairs as they were watching it and I saw the image of the tornado like ripping right at the beginning. And I was like, oh gosh, this is terrifying. But I got hooked, like I got so hooked with weather. And I, I used to be scared of thunderstorms. I would watch the news constantly. Um, but then that fear kind of turned into this awareness um, on one specific day. Uh, I was watching a thunderstorm come in. We had a severe thunderstorm watch out on the news and I was panicking. And I remember coming to my mom and being like, it's here, like it's coming. We need to get inside right now. 
And she was like, oh, okay, calm down. And, and I was like, I hope this is not a big one. Like I, I can't handle it. I hope it's not. And she turned to me and she goes, I hope it's a big one. And I was like, what? And she goes, yeah, I hope it's really bad. And I was like, why would you say that? And she goes, well, if it's bad enough, then the power will go out and we can eat all of the ice cream out of the freezer. And so I was like, hmm, <laughs> I like ice cream. <laughs> so I started being like, all right, let's like, let's hope it's a big one. Well, it hit, the power went out. We all got to eat ice cream. And I realized I didn't have to be scared of storms, but I could be just as aware as I was before. So uh, I just started getting really into meteorology. I followed it through elementary school where I created a storm chase club on the playground and then middle school, I you know ran the weather station. And then high school, I got to study um, a, a college class just my senior year. Um, so I just kind of kept following it, but I also love to talk. So broadcast meteorology was a really great marriage of the two. Um, because I have a lot of great teachers in my life. And I think it's a lot more fun living life when you have someone to explain what's happening um, and to share in that joy and that magic. So that's kind of why I got involved into this. And luckily I was able to do this as a career. But day in a life of a meteorologist, a broadcast meteorologist, the best way to explain it is it changes every day. Um, so for example, today I got in at about 10 a.m., but I'll be here until midnight. But my coworkers got in at 2 a.m. and they'll probably leave around 10 or noon. So you get in, the very first thing you do is you forecast. So a lot of our data and information is online. You can look at a lot of forecast models and things from subscribed sites or free sites. And uh, you have to kind of lean on your local knowledge and then balance all of that information together to create your forecast. From there, um, you do web articles and social media and you update the radio and you use all your fancy graphics to create a weather story. Um, so that when someone's waking up or coming home and they don't wanna to think too hard, you can hopefully just walk them through using the best graphics that you can. Um, and if there's like something special, like you're like, man, it's been cloudy lately, then you go and you look up all the extra stats and facts about cloudiest summers or how cloudy we were compared to last time. And then I usually show up in jeans and so then I have to change into a dress and do hair and makeup real fast and then uh, and then you go on air. Um, you have a lot of different weather hits. It's very fast paced, very changeable. You have to be ready at any time. Um, and it's a lot of problem solving, a lot of last minute problem solving. If something breaks, if something moves, you have to be ready. You have to be able to um, handle that. So luckily, um, growing up, I used to procrastinate a lot, which means you're really good at last minute. <laughs> so even though I now know as an adult how to prepare things, um, that, that part is pretty good. So yeah, it's just a lot of moving and changing. Sometimes you go out into the field. Sometimes you turn a weather story. Um, you have to be prepared for anything and to be able to talk to anybody. But I love it. So I'm really lucky to do it. Get to talk to people like you, <laughs> which is fun. Yeah. Thank you. I have one more question in the chat. We are okay. approaching the end, but then I would really encourage anyone else who hasn't asked a question or um, or written it in the chat to un unmute uh, yourself in the last few minutes. So what about the green color that precedes some mini tornadoes? All right. So that's great. Um, you know how with a sunset, you have a, a change in the color of the sky because the sun is traveling through a thicker portion of the atmosphere at that time. So with a thunderstorm, you have so much moisture uh, being sucked up from the surface and thrown into the sky that it actually changes the color of the sky into a greener hue because there's so much moisture up there. So hail cores, because there's so much moisture there, typically look the greenest. If you were to be out in the high plains looking at a thunderstorm, it'd look very gray, very dark, but, but with the hail core, it's almost like a whitish green. So if you see a green color or a green hue taking over the sky as the sun's getting low and hitting some of those particles, then you know that it's an especially strong storm. <laughs> and it's another indication to maybe go inside <laughs> sooner rather than later. That's a great question. 
Right. Does anybody have anything else before we wrap? I, I remembered one other thing from my childhood uh, in the tornado. I we were kind of told that they lift when they come near a body of water. Mm. Is there anything to that? I would say uh, no. Um, this is another one of those myths that you hear a lot, um, but tornadoes will go wherever they wanna go. They will go through a downtown, they will go through a valley, they will go over a lake. And I've watched one go over a river. It was an EF1 and we caught it on the sky cam when I, when I worked in North Carolina and went right over the little Washington river. Um, what you do have to think about sometimes is that with weak tornadoes, there are some surface factors or microclimates that can either make the tornado suddenly stronger or make the tornado suddenly weaker. So if you have a big enough river and the tornado is kind of a wimpy one, then yeah, it could kill it. But a river is not a guarantee that you'll stay safe. <laughs> it's a great question. That's a good question. So, Ellen? Yeah. Oh, I, hi. Go okay, this is Ellie hi. with a question. Yes. Hi there. And um, my question is, um, I'm from Ohio. Okay. And I married into a family that, that spends summers up north a lot. And, and on the evening, we go to the beach at Lake Michigan near Charlotte Boy and look out and watch the sunset. And then everybody says, watch for the green flash. Watch for the green flash. We're not leaving until, you know, we give it a chance to have a green flash. And I thought they were completely nuts. And then I saw Pirates of the Caribbean. No, <laughs> there is one. <laughs> but I just wondered, what. so what is all that about? Yes. If, if it is true. Okay. Thanks. So the green flash does exist. However, it is so hard to see and so rare. So uh, <laughs> basically what happens is uh, at sunrise or sunset, as, as the sun is going down on the horizon, uh, it goes through the different wavelengths of color because it's, it's traveling through a thicker portion of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So right at the ends, right at that last moment, it can be traveling through a thick enough layer that the wavelengths of the light momentarily turn green. Um, wow. But again, it's very hard to see. I have yet to see it, um, but there are legitimate scientists that say it is an actual oh. thing. So uh, if you see it, you have to let me know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I will. Scientifically, it's said to be possible and actually exist. All right. Good. Well, thank you. Clear Absolutely. that up a bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, another question a little bit about your job. So, you talked about, you know, your day and so forth. I don't think she's hearing us. Um, oh, and, uh, okay. um, so, and you, uh, you talked about hours. So yeah. we see you on TV at different times of the day and, and so forth. Are your hours the same? Do they, do they change a lot? And do you have support? Like you talked about hair and makeup and dress and all that oh, stuff. Right. <laughs> do, is, is somebody doing that stuff for you and picking uh, out your clothes or is that all up to you? I mean, how oh, does that, all that work? Me. Yeah. So if you don't like my hair or my outfit the particular day, you can just blame me. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I am doing the best I can, but there are some days even that I'll find an outfit and I'll like it in the store and I wear it in front of the chroma key and I see myself on camera for the first time and I go, nope, never again with this one. <laughs> um, so that's, that's a little trial and error. But as far as hours and stuff, um, it's just like with anything, I think the more seniority you get, the higher up you get, the more consistent schedule you have uh, and the more you can kind of pick your hours. But right now I am Monday through Friday and usually about 2 p.m. to midnight. But when I was hired here seven years ago, I did the triple shift on the weekend. So I would uh, work Thursday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Friday from 10 to 7. And then I oh would my. come in at 2 a.m. on Friday and work until 8 a.m. And then back at 2 p.m. and work till midnight and then back at 2 a.m. again and work until 8 a.m. Wow. Oh, so, no. uh, <laughs> so you kind of, you know, you just, you roll with it. Um, and then even before that, you know, 
uh, you just kind of roll with it. And what it does is I think it makes you a stronger person and you get to um, experience all the different types of weather and all the different time frames. Like morning news on the weekend is a very different feel than the evening news at 6 p.m., <laughs> you know? Um, so you get to kind of run that whole gamut, but yeah, it's a very, it's a very autonomous position. Like I get a, I get to be my own person and I collaborate with people, but a lot of what I do is just me. Um, so segments that I want to produce web articles that I do talks that I do, um, that's usually just me wanting to do them. Which Great. Is, yeah. <laughs> which means I can like step back at any time, which is fun too. I can be like, nope, not today. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for all that feedback. And I'll turn it over to Susan to kind of final finalize our, our meeting. But um, we appreciate you spending a couple extra minutes with us and just so appreciate you being with us. So Susan, yeah. go ahead and close the class for us. And ditto on that one, uh, Ellen. It's been very informative, um, very engaging. Thank you so oh, much for spending time with us answered a lot of my questions and I think uh, quite a few other questions too. And I'm really happy, happy to hear that someone experienced the, the tornado in the 50s. I, I was very young then, but I still have some of it in my head and I had to be very, very young, but I think it was so terrifying. It's something you don't shake off, but um, wow. uh, thank you for your time. Uh, great presentation. And, uh, and I think all of HASP appreciates it too. Thanks so. for having me. It means a lot. And it was nice to meet you guys. Virtual or audible round of applause. Right. Yeah. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it was you. wonderful. It was nice to meet you guys. <laughs> so Bye. Have a wonderful day. Ellen, if there's any reason that you need to stay and we talk, that's great. Otherwise, thank you so much. Susan Couch, David, thank you for your leadership. And everybody enjoy our partly sunny day. <laughs> now, now we know. Well done. <laughs> Bye guys. Thank you for having me. I loved it. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.